Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Astrology Hub podcast. This is our flagship show dedicated to showcasing the multitude of astrological perspectives and techniques. We feature legends in the field, as well as up and coming astrologers. And I am so excited to be here today with a legend in the field, Michael Erlewine. And we're going to be covering some really interesting territory today. We're going to be talking about where astrology came from according to the Buddhist teachings. And we're also going to be going into astrology as an advanced form of oracle. So I am so grateful to be here with Michael. I'm so grateful to be here with all of you. Thank you for joining us. And Michael, welcome back to the Astrology Hub podcast. Glad to be here. All right. So let's start with, well, for those of you who don't know him, Michael, is an astrologer, but also a polymath, which I just learned what this term means. It means an expert in many different fields. So he's he's an expert in uh, music. He has one of the largest musical libraries, uh, musical databases in the world. He also has uh, the largest, there we go. He has um, the two largest film databases in the world. No, one of two. One of the two largest. One of two. Okay, thank you, Michael. He also started the first astrological software. So for those of you who are grateful that you can go onto your computer and cast a chart within minutes and look up all kinds of different, uh, you know, coordinates and, and transits and really dive into the charts using the aid of computers and software, you have Michael to thank for that. We all have Michael to thank for that as he pioneered that whole um, that whole way of doing astrology, which has truly changed astrology forever and made it so much more accessible to all of us. And so for that, we are forever grateful, Michael. Huh. And um, Me too. I mean, I'm grateful because <laughs> I needed to have it, right? Because I'm as yeah. you. Yeah, exactly. So you saw a need, you wanted it yourself, and then you created it, which is right. fantastic. All right, so let's start with this topic of where astrology came from, like where the origins, people ask this all the time, like where did astrology even come from? How did it start? And I know there's lots of different uh, perspectives on this, but it would be fascinating to dive into the Buddhist teaching since that's where a lot of your background is. So can we start? Uh, Some of my background, also I've studied uh, not just Tibetan astrology, but Indian astrology, and Chinese astrology, and of course, Western astrology for, mm-hmm. for many, many years. Mm-hmm. But if we want to talk about, and I'm, you're going to get many different views on this, but th- if you want to, in, in 2004, my Dharma teacher, I, I've worked with a Tibetan Dharma teacher, doesn't even speak English. He's, he p- passed away, I'm sorry to say, uh, but I was with him for 36 years um, and worked closely with him mostly studying, learning to meditate and, and to do what's called um, Mahamudra meditation, and Vipassana or insight meditation, stuff like that. I got a chance to go with Rinpoche and some of his senior students, mostly lamas that had been had done a three-year closed retreat. And we just got to go along, which was kind of great. And one of the places we went, aside from Tibet, which I'd been to before, we went to China, and in China is a place called uh, Mount Wutai Shan. Mount Wutai Shan are five mountains in the form of a, a die, a number five die, with, you know, four a square with a dot in the middle. Mm. Those are five mountains, and we went and spent a week there, and we went to the top of each mountain, and we did what's called puja, prayers, say prayers, uh, and invoked, and, and what was special about this, my teacher knew that I loved astrology. In fact, he came to our center, which we've run a Dharma center for many years, so since the 80s, uh, called the Heart Center, uh, KTC, Karma Teksum, Cheerling. And he came and gave a special teaching there. Was, uh, but he knew that I would, would want to go to Mount Wutai Shan and probably tease me about it. I don't remember exactly. But the reason he took us there, or one of the reasons, is that according to the teachings, uh, the Tibetan teachings and the Chinese teachings, that at Mount Wu Tai Shan was the place that astrology first entered our world system. And the way that happened is that 
is a Tibetan a Buddhist deity called Manjushri appeared in the form of a youth at Mount Wutaishan and from the top of his head came the 84,000. 84,000 is a term that Buddhists use a lot just to mean a lot. But the 84,000, not dharmas, but astrology dharmas, right? So that's a big difference. Um, and these, these dharmas, which are called, well, I'll get to this, poured out and, and he gave them all to humankind. And people loved it. People loved astrology and they loved it so much that uh, Manjushri was noticing they weren't really doing their dharma practice. I'm just saying this very colloquially. I mean, just, just so you get the idea. It could be very long, but I'll try not to be so long. Um, and so he he felt badly. So he set up. He he took back all of the teachings, all the terma, and uh, so that people would you know get because one of the things that as my teacher said to me is that astrology, and he told me this very clearly, was it's one of the limbs of the yoga. The yoga means to join, of our, our mixing our mind with the mind itself, but it's not the root. Uh, astrology is one of the limbs of the yoga, but not the root, root. And if we have time, I could explain that because astrologers really need to understand that, that mm -hmm. astrology, astrology is basically something that, it's, that works in our, some, what we call samsara. This, Workaday world we're in with subject and objects and, and samsara is the cyclic world that we live in, uh, ups and downs and ins and outs and arounds and so forth. Um, so anyway, um, he took it all back, and then um, what's called the second Buddha is, is Padma Sambhava, also called Guru Rinpoche great being, second, second only to Buddha, whatever. I mean, all this is kind of like uh, legendary stuff, right? I mean, I don't know. I'm just telling you the story. Like I was told to me, I know nothing about it other than I was there. I went to this place and stuff like that. Is that he went to Manjushri and Guru and she said, please, uh, these people are sad. Human Humans are sad. They would like to have this. And and finally, uh, Manjushri was convinced that, okay, but here's what, but there's a caveat here. There's a, there's a but. I'll do it, but I'm going to, instead of just giving it back, I'm going to hide all these 84,000 teachings throughout the world, in the middle of rocks, under rocks, in, deep in the sea. But maybe the greatest proportion or a great proportion I'm going to hide in the mind itself. So these are what the Tibetans call terma. And someone who finds one of these treasures is called a tertan. And the tertan, anyway, so we went, so Mount Wush Taishan is where all this happened. And I've had the, my good fortune, I mean, part of being an astrology person, as deep as I went into it, I was able to, um, pull out of my mind techniques that never existed in astrology before I came along. One of them is called local space, uh, the whole world of heliocentrics. You know, I went to, when I went to see like the Dalai Lama, except he's called the Karmapa, who's the head of our lineage. I've, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, and I'm at 15,000 feet and here he is, and we can't speak English, but he says, gave me a name. He says, you are Tenzin Nima. And I said, well, what's that? And our guide translates as a holder of the sun, keeper of the sun. Uh, and in astrology, I'm known as a heliocentric astrology, someone who understood and is empowered to some degree in heliocentrics. Um, so anyway, the idea of what happens that, and I've been trying to encourage my fellow astrologers for oh, 40, 50 years at least, to not just read another book, to not just go and read about astrology and try to learn techniques. Techniques are extremely powerful things. 
somebody develops a technique and releases it in the world, it's not toxic, but it's so condensed that unless you're empowered so that you understand it, what's called realize it. Uh, and this is what happens with terma. If you go into your own mind and you find a hidden astrological treasure, it's not like you can just take it out and pass it around. First, you have to receive it and you have to understand it. It has to imprint you like uh, an intuition. Then you have to experience it. That means you have to make it real and live it. Then if you can do that, you have to fully realize its nature and what it is, after which you've received the empowerment, you're capable of empowering others with it. So my point is that in the world of astrology, I can't say much about my doing this with Dharma, although I've studied Dharma as hard as I can for a very long period of time. But with astrology, I'm very fortunate in the sense that I have brought a number of things out of the mind, spent years studying them and until I was empowered uh, enough so that I could actually communicate them to others, which I'm trying to do a little bit of right now. Um, so that's the idea. So that you know, we spent a week there and a lot of other things happened as well. And then we also spent weeks in, in Tibet itself going to, uh, well, where Rinpoche uh, was born, for instance, and, and, and uh, lots of stuff would go on. But anyway, so that's the rough story. So great, Michael. I love this. Couple questions for you. Sure, yes. All right. So you said that astrology works in the context, or these astrology dharmas, they mm -hmm. work in the context of samsara. Yes, let's talk about that. Yes. Okay, well, that's pretty simple. But if I had to say one thing to my fellow astrologers, of which when I ran my software company, which is, was called Matrix, still is Matrix Software, I just don't own it. Uh, I think we went through some 40,000 astrologers that not, I didn't know them all, but for a short time or for many years or 10 years, so everyone came through our center. All the famous people, I mean, people like Dane Rudyard, was at my house teaching or Robert Hand or you name them, there's almost no, uh, 20th century astrologer that probably, uh, because if they wanted software, this is where they got it. Um, so now, now I lost my track. Okay, so we're talking about samsara, and you're saying this is something that you would you would want all astrologers. Oh, oh that's right. To okay, so yep. so the important thing to understand is that this world that we live in um, is not nirvana. There's the the Samsara is this world, uh, dualistic world of, as I said before, cyclic world that we live in. We're not enlightened. We haven't reached nirvana, whatever that is. And what Rinpoche made clear to me is that astrology is made to work in this world that, that we're in. And I, I'll give you a story. This is the way I, when I used to teach it, uh, just imagine that the earth is a globe of water covered with water with wind and waves and on that globe is a single sailboat with a with a sail and you can by setting the sail you can move anywhere you want to on the globe but you can't um, you can't get off the globe and you can't go to the center of the globe or anything like that so what they're trying to say, I mean, I, I made up this analogy, that, is that the, that boat is astrology. Astrology is made to be used in this world because it can, and I did readings for many years for people. What it can do is help us, and this is, we're kind of talking now about readings, which we were gonna maybe talk about. Mm -hmm. the point is that, that what can happen in a reading astrology readings, the astrologer, if they're any good, can help the client to recognize where they're at. And, and it's, it's, I mean, it, it, we all have some recognition, but we mostly don't accept what's troubling us, right? We don't really 
you have to accept something in order to change it. And so what astrology does in this analogy of the boat is astrology can pick us up where we are, help us to reset our sails and head to a better part of samsara, which is more happy, uh, more convenient for us. But it will never take us to the root of the mind, which is the mind itself. It, it's not built for that. You know, for that, we do what's called dharma. We, we learn to recognize, which is a whole other thing, the nature of our own mind. And that's, that's something we could talk about, but that's, that's very difficult. So I'll just re re repeat what Rinpoche said. Astrology um, is one of the limbs, like a tree, of, of the yoga, but it's not the root. The Dharma is the word. If you want to go to the center, which you can't go on the globe, it would be going inward, inward. On the outside, astrology. So another way to say this, it's a little crude, is that astrology is like uh, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. You can rearrange it as much as you want, try to get comfortable, but you know, we, are, we are all uh, going to pass on. We're all going to die. And we're, it, this world is very, very much impermanent. And that we need to, astrology can't solve that for us, but it can make us as comfortable as possible. It helps us to make ourselves more comfortable than we are. And that, it, that really works. And astrology does do that, that it doesn't, astrology is not Dharma. Dharma is the Dharma, right? How, how, to, how to actually realize the nature of our own mind. It's not going to come out of an astrology chart. Um, it's going to point us in the direction, but it's not going to give us the ultimate. You can point us in the be... direction, but yeah. the practices, it, it doesn't have, for instance, practices. I mean, there's all kinds of guided meditation, which is not what meditation is about, but it's, it's not going to do that for us. We're going to have to eventually, if we want to learn meditation in the way that it was originally taught by someone like the, the, the Buddha, then that's a whole nother series of techniques that astrology doesn't cover. Astrology, right. we, can, we can yearn and use astrology, like something that we talked briefly about. Astrologers try to take out of the chart, you know, their natal chart. And I did this, of course. Uh, for a while, it was my everything. I didn't have any other thing to, is, and the reason I got into astrology in the first place is I was raised in the 40s and the 50s, because I'm 80 years old at this point. Um, and the modern psychology was just kind of coming up. In the, uh, and so that I was troubled that I had to learn who I was, what, you know, that you're paranoid or you're schizophrenic or you're all this stuff. But none of the things, oh, you know, you're noble, you're all the things that used to be ways of finding out what qualities you have. Well, astrology came along, I found astrology was more like that. It gave me another, an alternate way of seeing myself other than some form of uh, psychological impairment, right? Right, yeah. But they were having a heyday. The psychologists <laughs> were going crazy, being really happy about being able to diagnose and that it was very painful for people that were just kids, like I was, mm -hmm. to have to think of yourself in that way. Mm -hmm. And astrology taught me, gee, I could think of myself uh, this way through, through astrological terms. And it was much, much more. So anyway, that's how I got into it, to astrology mm -hmm. is because it was uh, gave me something to compare to. And what I started to say is that astrologers try to get everything, try to use astrology as the only thing they have. And when there are actually many different charts, there's more than one chart. There's the geocentric chart that we've used for centuries. There's a heliocentric chart, which we have not used that Copernicus pointed out to both, astrologers used to be astronomers and astronomers used to be astrologers. About 500 years ago, Copernicus said, hey, everyone, everything doesn't revolve around us. It's not all about us. We actually revolve around the sun. Astrologers never bought that. And they haven't got it yet, but astronomers walked away with the astrology chart, which we know, 
and the, the, the heliocentric, we call it a astronomy chart. I call the common chart, I call it a karma chart, the one we know. And I call the helio one a dharma chart because it shows who we are. The modern chart that everyone uses, uses is a chart of your, of your karma, of the circumstances in which you've been born and what you're gonna have to live in and through. But it doesn't say enough and I used to try to pull everything I could out of that chart about who you are, what's your archetype, what tribe do you belong? That's your Dharma chart. That's your heliocentric chart. And you put, once you have two charts, you have something to compare to. You have like triangulation, you have like a 3D view of who you are. And so this is something I've been trying to point out to astrologers, but they're just uh, unable to. Uh, and it's probably my fault for not being a good teacher. They're not able to realize this. They're not able to, they don't use the, they don't, they don't have two charts. They have one chart from which they get everything. Try, try to, but I've learned that one chart is not enough. You have to have different views that all triangulate to create what would I say something like a three-dimensional three view. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's a long ramble there, but it's great though, Michael. I, I think potentially it's not your fault that that they're not uh, looking well, at the heliocentric. I, I think there's a there's so much in the geocentric perspective alone that it can be overwhelming to think, oh my gosh, I have to learn another one. But I, I can definitely see the benefit, and I could really feel what you said when you when you said that you get a triangulation, you get uh, you get a different perspective that's more three-dimensional than that's right. a flat dimensional perspective. For anybody interested in exploring more of this heliocentric, these heliocentric ideas, and you're going, what's a heliocentric chart? I've never really heard of this. We do have two previous episodes with Michael that you can tune into. We have episode sure. 361 and we have episode 328. So both of those, and if you're on YouTube going, I don't see the numbers. If you do have a podcast player or on the website, on our website, astrologyhub.com, you can see the episode numbers and that will actually point you in the right direction to those previous Michael Erlewine interviews where we go into those topics a lot deeper. So check those out. Michael, let me just make sure I understand. And I'm going to ask you one more question sure. before we move on to astrology as a advanced Oracle, okay. but essentially there's these 84,000 uh, uh, astrological dharmas that right, dharmas. got spread out into all corners of the world, but the most, and these are like keys or, or teachings right. around astrology. That's right. But most of them have been buried or hidden in our mind. That's right. You have had the amazing experience to actually access some of these termas. Am I saying I that did. right? Termas? And actually, essentially, it must feel like downloading or uncovering some like hidden just script in your mind to find an astrological technique that actually works and it is to... it's something that you intuit yes it's like breathing in air fresh air something that you don't know what it is you can't see the end of it but you just cannot but want wow. to know it right wow. and in the process of knowing it it evolves into uh, a realization and the steps that it takes to get that realization are what we call in astrology techniques. Mm. And astrology has many techniques like the Saturn cycle that, that we have learned, but we probably didn't learn them from somebody that could empower it. They could show us the steps to go through to do it, but that's just like the skeleton. That's not the heart and soul of it. You need to be empowered from somebody that has been empowered before you in order to, uh, to be able to do that. This is leading right into my next question. So one of the things you said is that through the last 40, 50 years, you have really encouraged astrologers, not just to read books, not just to copy techniques right. and, and think of it as a mechanical thing that there's an actual, you went through a three-step process, which was really interesting. You said, that the technique or the tool or the idea needs to imprint you, then right. you need to experience it. Fully. And then you can fully realize its nature. It, it reminds me of 
gardening. You know, there's a seed that's like <laughs> okay. an imprint, right? There's a seed and then that. you water it and you fertilize it and you, you form a relationship with it. And then yes. it sprouts and you don't necessarily even know what it's going to look like or what it's going to become, but you experience that process of unfolding with it, right? Ultimately, there's a difference between experience. We all are experiencing stuff every day, mm -hmm. but realizing what it is that we are experiencing is a different thing because experience comes and goes. We feel really good now, but mm -hmm. we're really bright. We're having a breakthrough. We're seeing life as it is. But two, two weeks later, we're crawling on the ground. A, a, a psychic once told me about the story of the little little kid was trying to get off the bottle, you know, maybe three or four years old or whatever it was. So the, the little kid went to the edge of the porch and threw a bottle of milk uh, into the bushes. And, you know, a few hours later, it's out there crying her eyes out trying to find the bottle, right? That's how, that's what experience is. We, we say, oh, now I have experience, but three weeks later, we, we can't really remember it. We're, we're certainly not feeling that way now. Right. Realization. It's like when you realize like how to turn on a light switch. Once you someone shows you, that's not something you forget. So, mm -hmm. but it's much more complicated when we get to spiritual realization. But it's still just as simple. Once you realize something, you never walk it back. It never goes back. Once you realize the nature of your mind, in particular in the Dharma training, it never. It, it never it can go fallow you, you're not doing anything with it but it, you never go back to not having had that realization so mm -hmm. in astrology i've tried my very best to, you know oh that's one thing if you if you go to my one of my websites um which is simply i don't know how i can't spell it but i can just spell it it's just spirit s-p-i-r-i-t groove Grooves, G R O O V E S, spiritgrooves.net or .com. There are hundreds of free ebooks, including I think 56 books on astrology that mm. cost you nothing. Mm. So I've tried to take a lot of these realizations and give you all that you need. And of course, you would have to take somebody that has the has the need within them to want to absorb this stuff. And go through that. So I, I don't expect a lot. And also on Facebook, Michael Earlywine, uh, I blog every single day, not always on astrology. A lot of it's on Dharma. But today I'd, I blogged about raptors watching. We're going to go up north and to where all the top of the uh, UP of Michigan, the land funnels to a point and all the great birds come there before they try to fly across Lake Superior. I'm gonna go up there and so I mean I, I'm saying I blog, blog on whatever interests me that idea so thank you for that it's 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 beautiful it definitely check out the Facebook page and that website and and what I'm hearing you say is that you can only receive the teachings that are in these 56 books that you wrote and and all these different things if you have the willingness and the receptivity and the and that, the that last or, word the receptivity yeah. That but you have to train for that. You can't, we're just not naturally that receptive. We, you mm -hmm. have to learn to open up and let go. You have to be willing to receive. Um, in the Buddhist training, they have what are called the point, pointing out instructions. The teacher can point it out as to, and what's pointed out is the nature of our own mind, that we would get it enough that we would become familiar with it. We could start to say, oh, I see how it works like this. So same with astrology that there, you have to get, I mean, if, if anything, like people could keep asking me, I get interviewed in different ways, you know, what is missing in modern astrology? What's missing in modern astrology is that astrologers assume that the mind, their astrological mind, just as it comes out of the box, just as they, they were born, that they're good to go. And Dharma doesn't look at that. It looks like, no, you, you need to be, learn to become receptive, to be able to hold a teaching, uh, for, to, to, to take it in and then go through the process which you pointed out 
of understanding and experiencing it and eventually realizing it, at which point you are empowered then to pass it on. So mm -hmm. I've spent a lot of my life trying to uh, encourage astrologers not so spend so much time um, studying books and techniques that are themselves intricate and difficult, but start to look, to look at your own mind, to, just to learn to be still, to, to sit and do nothing and not be bored, uh, to start to, 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 to rest in the mind itself, just for moments, just for a moment until a thought comes. But that's the, uh, the way a lot of Dharma is taught is that thought, the thoughts are like waves on the ocean. They're never gonna stop. You're never gonna stop thoughts coming. But when they come, it means that you're, you're, you're brought back out of whatever you're in, back into some sort of subject and object. I'm thinking about this, we're speaking. This is dualistic, but we can learn to rest non-dualistically in the mind itself where, where there is no subject or object, if only for a moment, but you have to start practicing that. You have to start letting yourself, you can't rest the mind. We can't do anything with the mind, but we can allow the mind, really this, we can allow ourselves to rest in the nature of the mind. The nature of the mind will never change, but we're foreign to it to the degree that we've separated ourselves from it. So that idea, I'm sorry to be a preacher, but there's a little bit of that uh, as well. Question for you. Yes. So, so you talked about the three, the three things, imprint, experience, and fully re realize. Realization. And, and realization. And or you, recognition. Okay. Recognition, recognizing, oh, this is how it works. Right, right. And that once you have that, you can't forget it. It's like, it's-, it's No, but then it's, it's through and through, you're in it, you're right. it. Okay, so my question is, and you, you've, you've felt passionate about this enough to, to speak it to astrologers and to, and to really um, try to impart that wisdom to astrological students. Right. What do you see happens when we don't do that? What do you mean when we don't do that? When, when we don't, when we don't, when we go out and we, and we just try to learn a technique and then start teaching it you know, in a couple of weeks, or we, you know, we don't allow it to really yeah, become part it. of our realization. Mm -hmm. Well, simply, we don't know what we're talking about. Hmm. We, okay. Maybe you can do the technique, you can turn a meat grinder and sausage will come out. Um, <laughs> but we have no idea what we're doing. We certainly couldn't teach someone else how to do it, because we don't really know it ourselves. We just know how to practice that technique. Like, an analogy would be that in Dharma, if you ask a Dharma person, what are they doing? So I'm doing my practice, my Dharma practice. That's not meditating. That's practicing meditation. That's the difference. It's the same difference in astrology. Many astrologers can do these techniques and get some result, but they have no idea. They've never realized and they don't know uh, that technique there's a realized thing inside and out. And I, I, I'm saying that that's the only thing that's a really valuable that I know of is, to, is what you realize. Mm. I mean, I can do, I have the, probably the, one of the largest astrology libraries in the world, uh, which I gave to a university, but thousands and thousands of magazines and books. I look through all of them, some, I certainly didn't intend to read them all. It would be horrible anyway. Uh, that's just not enough. There's a point after which we don't, we're not going to need to, we, or we shouldn't, if I can say shouldn't, shouldn't just read another book. I'd rather read another book than actually go and look at the mind itself, which is right there with me, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I wouldn't. I'd rather go and in, into the mind itself. The point is, if we're always just going to read another book, we're always just getting ready to actually go and do what the logical thing is, is to actually inundate or immerse ourselves in, in the mind itself, whether it's the mind of astrology or the mind of Dharma or any other topic. At mm -hmm. some point, we're gonna to have to stop reading and be, as my teachers say, I had my first Dharma teacher said, Michael, someday you have to be the book. Mm. Wow. Just, instead of just reading another book. Yeah. So that idea, okay. so. I don't read astrology books anymore. And I don't need to, I, I write them, 
or I talk like this, but uh, but it's not that I didn't pay the dues. I did. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Some invaluable wisdom here, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on to the next topic, which is how astrology is an advanced form of oracle. So what do you mean by that? Well, let's just talk about, first of all, what's an oracle? When I yeah. was young, I used to love all the oracles back in the late 50s and early 60s. You know, there was the I Ching and there was the tarot cards and there was chicken gizzards or tea leaves. Right. An oracle is, is whatever. It can be anything. It's whatever puts us in touch with, we could say ourselves, but that's just a circle. Just a circle. The oracles allow the universe to speak to us, for us to communicate, whether you do the tarot cards or, and astrology is just, uh, aside from what astrology is mechanically, it can be an oracle, it's just a complex oracle, but it's still, what is, what is it that we want from doing astrology? What is it that, why do we even do it, other than all the stuff of maybe some people do it to make money or the impress their friends or but most of us start out trying to find out more about ourselves from our astrology chart and I still do the same I'm, I'm no different um, I see a new technique I want to see for instance like transits in astrology have always worked for me but progressions for me have never worked even though I learned to program every many many different kinds of directions and progressions, but I could never, I never, it never did anything for me, but transits right on the money for me. So I think that we've got to find, if I had to say what it, I did in life that was the best thing is that it was that I followed my interests to the exclusion of school. I mean, I never, you know, I flunked school, I left school, never finished high school because I was not interested. I've always followed exactly, which as a kid, it was mostly in nature, mother nature. Uh, I know all about salamanders and frogs and stuff like that. And, and so good that I even had a little office in the University of Michigan Museums building because I was a little bit of a prodigy about really being into salamanders, right? And finding out ways of telling how old a salamander is not by measuring them with a ruler, which is what they did, but by studying the thin bones of the skull, the perisphenoid bone has growth rings on the bone. You can see exactly how, and I'm saying that was the kind of stuff I did that people had, I don't ever know they ever did before. So I'm just saying that you got the idea. I lost my train of thought, which is something I'm doing older as I get older. So, so you said that you have followed your interest. That's, That's the right. one thing in life you've done that seems Absolutely. to have been very rewarded by doing that, following your interest to the exclusion of school. So basically you had to go against what everybody else valued as educated or intelligent. No, they would say, that they would say, well, see you at the car wash, Michael. <sighs> No, no, I got accepted at University of Michigan, even without, but I went for three weeks. I said, this is just the same stuff. Mm. I need to go and live life. I want to get into life. And I went out and lived. I just hung out with myself. Uh, I, I think of myself as what's called a phenomen phenomenologist. Someone who is studying the nature of their own consciousness. Mm. What's happening inside of me today, now? So I did that instead of going to school and all of my businesses, like I was a musician, I was an astrologer. They were all things that I loved. I never had any, I never made a living other than I had to work some jobs when I was really young, except for, I, I only made money from something that I loved. But this was very lonely and also very having no money because for many, many years, I wouldn't do the stuff I would have to do to have money. And so I had no money, right? Mm -hmm. even, uh, even though I would have kids. When I found out that we were gonna have kids, first thing I did was go out and work on a garbage truck just because I was terrified I wouldn't be a good provider. But turns out I am a good provider because pretty soon what I did was become an astrologer. So I'll just 
you know, I already was an astrologer. I'll just put out a shingle, which I did, on my and became a professional astrologer. But that is something I love to do, right? But it's not not easy money. I mean, going to conventions with mostly psychics and a few astrologers, very hard to make a living as an astrologer. Michael, do you think, I mean, I think the reason why people don't do, one of the reasons why people don't do what you did, which is follow your interest and, and not do the conventional thing, which is for a lot of people just doing a job to make money. Right. And what you're saying is that you, you at times in your life had to sacrifice making totally. money in order to stay aligned with following your interest in your passion. I wouldn't do, I wouldn't do it. I mean, I lived. You, wouldn't do, you just couldn't do it. There was something I, in you. I that couldn't was like, do I it inside do it. of me. It was yeah. the same with teachers that I had one teacher in the fourth grade, Mrs. Althaus, that I that I I could learn from. But all the rest of them, if if they didn't show me some life savvy, some some life, I couldn't learn from them. Mm. So it wasn't something I just said. Oh, it was something that I I literally couldn't do it. So I spent what, 11 years and something, just uh, waiting to get out of school, but always working on what I was working at home. Uh, so I think that, and also I, I learned nature's laws before I learned man's civilized laws. I think that was a big deal because nature doesn't blink. Na nature's a tough, I had somebody who said to me, oh, nature's so beautiful. I said, yeah, it's beautiful, but it's a raw beauty. Right. And it's, it's very, it's impermanence. It, in fact, even in Dharma, they have what's called the Lama of appearances, that you can learn Dharma from just mother nature, just by being, by, by experiencing clearly what really, what are the laws of nature? So I learned those before I learned civil law. So that if, if they weren't communicating to, to me with that kind of power, that nature has, I, I just didn't listen to them because I just I feel love, they're fooling themselves. I love the purity of this. I see this yeah. in children. Well, I see yeah. this, you know, they, 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 they're fighting against this convention. They don't want to be put into these boxes and, and that, that spark in them squashed out. And I think there's a huge movement now, especially of, of parents who are seeing this and aligned also and going, huh, I, I don't think this school thing is really serving and I don't really think it, right. it, it results in innovative, creative, passionate, engaged adults. It, it actually no, absolutely. No, most of that, right? No, we, we had home birth and we, we home educated, uh, not all of our kids, but uh, two of our kids uh, because I wanted them not to lose the freshness of the wonder and all my kids know about frogs and know about this that um yeah i think it's it's what interests us our natural interest is like a wellspring like a fountain that you want to drink from uh and you don't want someone to to put concrete over it so we did, that's the way we felt with our kids i mean we had a backyard full of cages of animals that were rehabilitating i was part of a wildlife rescue trying to get animals, uh, deer or whatever, ready to go back out and to heal them. So the kids grew up with stuff like that. Um, and they and it shows now because they're very creative. Hmm. And I have four kids and eight grandkids. Um, one of them is a very famous musician, yes? Yeah, one of, well, two of them are musicians, um, but one of them is, is pretty famous. May, May Early Wine is, uh, yeah, just be loved by she is. Uh, yeah, she is. Yes. So, Michael, what I see as a result of that path that you chose and were uncompromising about is that you have you have lived a prolific life. You have written prolifically. You have brought gifts in in every industry that you felt passionate about. You have left a legacy of creativity and gifts that continue to give. And I truly believe that that is possible for any one of us 
who who really dedicates our lives to the things that light us up from the inside. And so often astrology, it, it gives us the permission that we need to actually pursue those things because you can see in the chart, the wiring, or you can see, and, and so often in a reading for me, it's been like, Oh God, yes, I know that. I know that that's something that I could bring or I could give. And it's just like, okay, this is, this is just confirmation of what I already know. And it's like permission granted, go like, go for that. And, and it's one of the gifts I, I feel that astrology gives. I don't know if you agree with that. No, I agree with that. Totally. I mean, but I'm very sensitive about astrology uh, and the purity of astrology. And, and I'm not happy with a lot of what passes for modern astrology. All you have to just go to a convention or two. Uh, it's just sad. It's a, a lot of, I'm interested in trying to preserve. Uh, so there could be some lineage in astrology, something that could be passed on. Uh, it's just not much. It's all about just it's just like what I said when Copernicus pointed out that everything doesn't revolve around us. Astrologers never got it. They still think everything is about them when really uh, it's not. We revolve around the sun. The sun is the the arbiter of our life, and where all this. It, or that the idea that the sun is just a big hot ball of gas instead of a, a vibrant being, whatever it is that's in us, <laughs> the sun is part of that as well. So I've done my best and not been very successful at trying to encourage astrologers to, to look into their own mind and put their books aside and learn to, to actually pull from the mind, like we talked about, these 84,000 dharma teachings i mean buddhist dharma i mean i mean astrology teachings um i don't see that happening much for Michael, me. You, again you have not failed uh, the way that i <laughs> see it is you are a pioneer you have blazed yeah. ground you have you have blazed new toward new territory and it's like a, a field that you have tilled and fertilized and made ripe for seeds to plant in and it's just a consciousness unfolding and that you were ahead of your time. And thank you for being here and sharing these gifts because these are things that we can continue to share with people forever. And, yeah, I, get and, it. I, and I think that it's, it's, again, I'll use the word invaluable because this is coming from all of your 80 years of living life, of pursuing your passion, of going deeply into these different fields and pulling these gifts and keys out of your own mind and then sharing them. And each one of us, as we get exposed to people like you who have lived your life this way, it, again, it's that permission thing. It's like, okay, I could live my life that way too. And look what happens when, when one lives their life this way, they have so much to give in That's their true. elder years, so much to share. It's like, you're overflowing with things to share. And I, I know that for myself, that is an extraordinarily inspiring. And I mm. think that that would be for our audience as well. Uh, maybe so. I mean, uh, I think of myself, people constantly say, because I've also studied Dharma. Dharma is the hardest thing I've ever studied. Way, way more difficult than astrology. Um, I don't know how to even express it. That You have to... I could not do what I did. Maybe it's the way to say it. He said, I couldn't stand to be taught. I couldn't stand to be taught by somebody that uh, just was not interested, really, uh, in anything in their own life. Mm. Um, I mean, as I got older and became a musician, I spent a, many years, in fact, I was just reading a thing, a book. When a, my drummer was Iggy Pop. And we named him Iggy and stuff. And in his biography, he's talking about me that, that I was extremely pure about trying to un understand and be reverent about uh, black music, basically blues. And I interviewed scores of, 
of blues players and spent time with them. It wasn't just their music, it was the life savvy mm. that they, they had. I never had a granddad on either side. So I never had, and my dad never talked to us about anything personal. So I have a, a huge th thirst. And then when I found the Dharma people, even better because they weren't into alcohol and stuff like that. People who really knew about what they're doing. Um, I didn't know what I'm doing. I'm still just trying to learn. I don't think of myself as a teacher. I think of myself as a sharer, someone who, who wants to share everything that I'm amazed at. Uh, because I think that astrologers would be amazed too if, if they could um, trust themselves enough to, to, to go into the mind and learn how to do that. So that idea. So beautiful. Michael, thank you so much for everything that you've shared with us on this episode, on the previous episodes that we've had you on here at Astrology Hub. Again, if you're interested in more from Michael, you can go to episode 328 and episode 361 on the Astrology Hub podcast. And I, the way that I'm I'm envisioning this is we're creating a little bit of a library of you, of the things that you have, um, the things that you feel passionate about sharing with the astrological community. And I'm so grateful that you come to this platform and that you share the way you do. So thank you for that. And is there anything else that you wanna say before we close up? Oh, I'm good. I mean, and, and you've recorded this, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, good. No, I appreciate, first of all, I think you're a remarkable interviewer and I, and I know what I'm talking about because I've done a ton of interviewing myself. So um, I appreciate being invited to do this and to have a chance to share whatever I can, especially with a lot of astrologers. I love astrology and I love astrologers. I'm just sad about um, that our life couldn't be easier and that more astrologers Aren't, it's not recognized as a as a right livelihood. When I was first trying to get a a, a bank to give me a, a loan to buy my first calculator that I then became uh, made astrology from, I was proud of being an astrologer. And, I, and the bank examiner guy said, "Well, what are you? What do you do?" I said, well, "I'm an astrologer." And then he said, and he pulled up a thing. Said, "Well, that's right above migrant workers. We're not going to give you the loan." I went back three times. I eventually got the loan and that started it. But I'm just saying it's not necessary that we study astrology and not make a decent living. I couldn't agree more, Michael. It's one of the missions of Astrology Hub to continue to elevate the field and provide opportunities for people to make this a living. When, when I first got into it and I got exposed to a lot of different astrologers and saw that it was it was kind of like the starving artist mentality. Right. Like, like it's something you do because you love it, but you can't make a living. And most of them were, it was a side hustle. You know, they were doing it on the side, almost as like a, the thing they really loved doing, but they had day jobs. And I went, whoa, this doesn't make sense because they're providing so much value to people, like the kind of value that changes people's lives. Right. And they so shouldn't what? have to hustle. The, no. The idea no, that you have, have to be hustlers is just sad. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. And that's truly why one of the missions of Astrology Hub is to continue providing opportunities for astrologers to make this a career where you actually can dedicate your time and your energy and your your research and your practice and, and and meditating and all the things that we know need to do in order to be a good astrologer and and i'm so grateful to know that we have been successful in that for some astrologers and that we're continued to be dedicated to that and, and create new ways for it to get out into the world because it just doesn't make sense. You know, my Capricorn sun and Mercury and Venus is like, it doesn't make sense because I got more from my first reading than I got from anything I learned in psychology. And I have my master's in psychology, you know, anything that I've learned in any sort of counseling, I got the most from the astrology right. readings. Well, and no, no yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So to just, it's, it's like, this doesn't have to be this way. What can we do to change it? How can we well, contribute let me, to that? Let me, let me just say this, that in the Dharma, if you want to go study the Buddha Dharma, uh, what you find out pretty quickly is that the, the biggest problem that you have is your inability to receive the teachings. 
Mm. And so they have what are called the preliminary practices. And they have the common preliminaries, the extraordinary preliminaries, even the special. And what these are, they're just like, um, they're very arduous, difficult, like doing 100,000 frustrations on the ground, right? Yeah. That's just one of them. And I yeah. had to do it twice. My teacher, I did all of it. And then he told me to do all, all of it again, right? So 100,000 prostrations. Well, that's just one of them. Wow. 100,000 mandala offerings where you, you put sand in special piles on it. Anyway, there's, there's, it, was, it seemed medieval at the first look. Like I didn't want to do stuff, something like that. That seems so stupid. But it wasn't stupid because we are assuming that we're ready to receive and we have to first remove enough of our, we gotta see beyond ourselves. We gotta see ourselves has to become transparent enough that we can just love ourselves, but not follow ourselves because ourself is nothing more than our own likes and dislikes. It'd be like, uh, you know, like Jerry Mahoney, you know, a ventriloquist trying to follow instructions from the dummy. So we need to, uh, that's what I think we need. We need to do enough training to remove the obstacles, what's called our obscurations. Like, it's like seeing through dirty glasses. We need to clean the glasses. Then I think that astrologers could move forward, but that's my view of it, so. Well, I, I love that view and we'll we'll see, we're in it. You know, things are changing yeah. so much, it's although, true. You know, what you said about the uh, the bank loan, it, it, something very similar happened to us with Apple because we had, we're, we're developing an app to make it easy for uh, people to find great astrologers to have readings with. Mm -hmm. And so we, we submitted it to the Apple developer store and they rejected it. This is new. They have allowed some astrology apps to go through, but a new thing, they put it in the category of dating apps farting apps, <laughs> drinking game apps, uh -huh. and um, uh, psychic or, you know, something else. And they just, they said astrology is within those parameters and right. they are not accepting those anymore. And I just went, what? Like, what, yeah. what, like century are we in at this point? But it still exists and I and there's ways around it. It's like, okay, fine. We're not going to do your app. We're going to make it web-based, which we have done and which is it's going to be released into the world as a web-based thing. So, but it's yeah. still there. It's still there, amazingly. Welcome you know? to the world of astrology, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Um. Well, Michael, thank you again. It's been such a pleasure to share this time with you. Thanks to all of you for listening, for your sincere curiosity and your earnest love of astrology and desire to know more. I am so grateful that you're here. Thank you for tuning into this episode, for being a part of our community, and as always, for making astrology a part of your life. We'll catch Thank you. you. Thanks. Yeah, nice to be here. Happy nice to, be here. to be here. Oh, we're so happy to have you here, Michael. Um, and we'll catch all of you on the next episode. Take care, everybody. Okay.